Good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Money Control Masterclass. We are discussing a very pertinent issue on the show today. Why are some electric scooters in India catching fire? Why are some others involved in mishaps? Can this truly derail the momentum that we've seen as far as EVs and electric scooters are concerned? And what can you and me and brands do to really ensure rider safety? A lot of important, pertinent questions on this burning issue. Uh, we have a packed lineup today, some of the best voices from the industry. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Soinder Kill, who is the CEO of Hero Electric, uh, Mr. Vinkesh Kulati, who is the president of FADA, uh, Neeraj uh, Raj Mohan, who is the co-founder of Ultraviolet, as well as Chetan Mai, who is the chairman of Sun Mobility. We will also have uh, uh, Vivekanand joining us from Bow which member is a new maker thank you on money control mass um let me begin oh in fact vivek has joined us on the show so welcome on the show um vivek thank you all very much for joining us on money control masterclass on what is a very pertinent um issue um if you know if i can start with you mr gill you know this is boiled down to um, is there a lack of respect for testing, for engineering? Because, you know, this is hardware, but brands seem to be in a hurry to launch um, and scale fast. So where are we falling short? Um, you know, are internal testing standards inadequate? Because uh, this is causing a lot of concern. The images of bikes that were just spot going up in flames, people getting injured because regenerative braking is not working properly. Uh, what would you attribute this to? Vivek, welcome on the show. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the incidents are unfortunate. And the onus is clearly on the manufacturers here. And the learning is that extreme short-term countermeasures, what can be put in place to repose back the customer confidence and what can be done from today onwards to see to it that in real short term, maybe three to four months, we get better batteries and battery safety standards. So if I concentrate on the extreme short-term actions, obviously the qualitative checks or whatever you have in your stock or customers have or dealer stocks has to be done to ensure that the things are separated, segregated to the best of the possibilities to see that at least the known bad things don't pass on to the customers. And if he has it, it's recalled back as is being done by some of the OEMs. And within that also, uh, many things can be done on now onwards, at least safety as a type of a safety first performance later type of a verbatim that OEM should be doing in terms of spreading awareness even telling customers on how to keep the batteries or how to be contributing in keeping the batteries safe, whatever they have. And in extreme case of any such hazards which have happened, unfortunately, what action should be taken to at least prevent the loss of life and property. So these are the few of actions which must be done immediately to repose the customer confidence. But on the other hand, I, I, I luckily, fortunately, the walk-ins have not reduced. Only questions have increased. Customers are asking a lot of questions, which is a good thing. And in that, the learning is, I think the customers are becoming wiser what to buy, not to buy. And OEMs are all becoming more responsible on what to make, what to sell, and what to design. That's an interesting perspective. So it hasn't caused fear, but it has caused more discretion, uh, more questions, more checks on uh, the part of customers. Uh, but Chetan, if you can come in here, you know, is it also a tough journey because some of these standards don't uh, exist when it comes to high quality battery packs, electronics, and, you know, often manufacturers have to come up with it themselves. I mean, not regulatory standards, but in terms of other quality checks and requirements. You know, in any automotive industry, uh, standards can only do a certain amount, right? Beyond that, it's on the onuses of the OEM to do it. So India has an 038 and 156 standards, which are good, but that does one battery solution. And uh, but it starts really from the beginning to say how are we, you know, selecting cells, how are we designing the thermal management systems, how are we doing the battery management systems. And typically your internal testing would be 10x more than probably external. And then uh, also during manufacturing, the quality control systems, not just at what you would manufacture in-house, but also from your suppliers that come in because these cells today um, come from different suppliers on this area and they have to be qualified and they have to also be checked on this front. 
So um, I don't think that you know uh, one thing would fit all. It's about a larger ownership and responsibility that the industry has to take. It has to strengthen its valid validation processes. And I think also uh, designing a bit more for India, the levels of vibration and temperature and other conditions are a little bit more stringent here than probably some other geographies. And that has to be considered where the products are a little bit more designed and field tested. Um, very often products are put in market very quickly, but sometimes this would take six months to a year to really validate correctly to put out. And um, you know, with new technologies, that time should be given and taken by um, uh, OEMs as they launch out new products. Right. Um, Vivek and Neeraj, I want to bring you in uh, here as, you know, two uh, new age OEMs who he ha who we have on the show. Um, we were talking to Tarun of Aether recently and he said that, you know, they go through 120 tests at the battery pack level and 800 tests at the vehicle level. And most of these tests happen several times before launching every product. If you can tell viewers watching this show, you know, who perhaps want to look at Bounce or an ultraviolet, what kind of testing you know goes into your own products at the battery pack level at the vehicle level um how are you going to give them confidence and perhaps mr B mr gill can add to this as well uh, once both of you are done sure i think i'm um, happy to answer this question and i think um, one part of to all of this is understanding what are the requirements for the indian market right so um it's typical that you know the products that we put out there are going to be you know subject to some very extreme conditions whether it is on the road because of vibration and shock or even in terms of handling uh, misuse abuse right um, even you know shortcomings in terms of uh, the way the charges are connected the way that uh, you know um, the quality of power that is available the kind of other additional hardware or infrastructure that we have to deal with Right. So for all of these, there are tests that we have defined over and above, uh, you know, what the industry standards are or, you know, um, and this and just adding to what, you know, I think Tarun would have mentioned, which is that uh, we internally have to do these tests on every single battery pack that we make. Right. And these happen even before the battery pack is built. First, we check them at a cell level, then at module levels. Um, at individual battery management system levels and then as an integrated unit and then we go through you know several cycles of testing uh, before we actually put it on the vehicle where there's another check uh, when it's integrated onto the vehicle right so uh, the point here is to imagine all of the possible scenarios and uh, overcome them or deal with them in different ways right for example there are in our battery packs today at ultraviolet uh, we have five different types of protection, right? From electrical, electronics, software, mechanical, thermal. And each of these are meant to kick in at different intervals of time, right? So from, you know, microsecond level uh, cutoffs that happen or uh, duration that happens all the way to, you know, milliseconds and in seconds where a fuse blows, whether it's a cell level fuse or a module level fuse or even a battery pack level fuse, right? So there are several safety uh, measures that are in place and for different kinds of conditions, and it, it is a larger complex system. It's not as easy as building, you know, a lithium ion battery pack for a phone or for a device where a single cell is involved. We're talking about hundreds of cells here. And you can't even let a single cell sort of uh, run into a thermal runaway situation, right? So we're trying to get to that level of safety, which means the number of tests at both individual levels and at integrated levels have to be done. And that's something that we do um, internally as well. Right. Vivek? So, uh, uh, so Chandra, uh, I think uh, uh, like uh, Chetan mentioned and Neeraj mentioned, it's not just one silver bullet, right? As in, there are many things that you have to do properly to make sure that batteries are safe. For us, what what uh, is helping us is that we have been using the batteries. The batteries that we put in Infinity is the batteries we have been using from 2019, and cumulatively we have done on the road close to about 45 million kilometers, close to about 4.5 crore kilometers. Um, and uh, it has gone through all kinds of uh, abuse as well, as in we have gig workers who you swap the battery, etc. all of that. So it has seen extreme conditions. Uh, we have seen three summers, uh, including summers of Vijayawada, which sees crazy temperatures. Uh, I think it's it's uh, everything uh, right from the beginning, right? As in there is definitely a clear textbook thing that you have to follow. Uh, we think BMS plays a very important role. We think cell selection plays a very important role. Once all of these things are put together to make sure that it's working well, and continuously monitor that and see what is working, what is not working, and continuously improve your BMS as well, right? So 
both at the battery level, there, sh there should be cutoff mechanisms to make sure that uh, you're not abusing the battery. And I think um, uh, Soinder sir spoke about um, performance versus safety, right? I think uh, there's another thing uh, uh, which which I also want to talk about, the, uh, the balance between the capacity of the battery and the capacity of the motor, right? As in, if you're if you're discharging too much energy in a very short span of time to power a very powerful motor, the thermal management also has to be smart. Everything has to be smart, right? So um, uh, you can't take any short shortcuts here, is what what we understand. And um, while we have had zero incidents so far, doing this close to millions, perhaps and 45 million kilometers, we still continue to be always concerned and worried to make sure that we are doing everything at our best to make sure that there are no incidents uh, as such, right? So. But I think it's not one single thing. Um, we hear a lot of things from the industry saying that, okay, just it's, it's a problem with the NMC, NMC is not suited for India, etc. all of that. We think those are very vague statements to be made. Um, uh, we think it's all about um, putting a pack which is perfectly makes sense for your scooter and you understand this to in totality, right? I think that is right. what is important. Um, yeah, I, I think this has no shortcuts and uh, the responsibility is on OEMs, as simple as that. Right. Um, in fact, we are getting a lot of viewer questions, so I, I'm going to take some viewer questions in a bit. But to those logging in, all our guests are live. So if you have any questions pertaining to EV safety, scooter safety, you know, just keep sending them to us. Um, Mr. Gill, do you also think, you know, there is perhaps too much emphasis on design and look and software and not enough emphasis on, you know, the safety part, the testing part? Because, you know, a lot of people say design is just 30%, but 70% is, you know, very boring stuff, testing, testing, testing. Do you think that is perhaps getting short shaft because people want to, you know, take the product to market um, in a in a quicker way, in a rapid way? Design is <clears throat> very important, but that's a bedrock. But on testing, I can add two dimensions here. See, <clears throat> testing, but if you see the Japanese method, that is called self-certification of supply chain. So if you choose the right supply chain, right vendors, institutionalized self-certification at their point when they are making the sales, then the quality is built into the manufacturing process. When we are doing checks and balances, either it is design validation or otherwise you are separating the wheat from the chaff. So from that point of view, both are important. First and foremost, like I say, the Japanese companies do, choosing the right vendors and making them responsible for giving the right quality is most important part. Second is the multiple checks that OEMs are doing right now and should increase. Third is even if the battery has gone to the customer, the multiple service checks which needs to be done during the lifetime of the battery is, has now also become equally important. So from end to end, from birth of a cell to the death of a battery, it has to be a comprehensive type of a system. Mr. Gulati, if you can come in here, um, Mr. Gill made an interesting point at the beginning of the show where he said, um, you know, footfalls haven't come down. It's just that customers have becoming uh, are becoming more discerning. They are asking more questions. Uh, what are your channel checks telling you considering, you know, I mean, I'm sure you speak to dealers every day, all day through the week. Uh, has this caused panic at the retail level? Are customers perhaps pulling back, holding back? on planned purchases, you know, the bad news around fires, around mishaps, etc. I mean, even the government was forced to react yesterday. So what are customers telling you? So uh, Mr. Gill has been right on this. See, practically, there is a lot of hype around EV, uh, not even two wheelers. Across all segments, EV is now the buzzword if you talk about auto. And uh, even if a person doesn't want to buy it or is not interested, then too, he'll inquire about an electric vehicle. Maybe if he gets an option, he may delay. But this is this is the trend happening, what we are seeing at the dealership. Even at uh, the legacy uh, dealers, where there is no EV yet launched, a customer comes in and asks about an EV. And he knows that the EV has not yet been launched. But still, that's the process, how it goes, because uh, that's the hype what EV has created. No doubt Mr. Gill is right. Uh, uh, there are some customers who have postponed their decision. But there are a lot of inquiries still. The footfalls has continued. Uh, and the major issue is I feel the supply chain in electric vehicle two-wheeler is also going through the similar phase. What because of seeing. the semiconductor. Uh, yeah. So and, and the battery imports and the cell import. And the, there are a lot of things to talk about. Maybe Russia crisis, China lockdown. There are a lot of things to say. But there is a supply chain crisis, and uh, which means every electric vehicle two-wheeler dealer or a manufacturer is sitting at at least three months or two months waiting 
so practically even if 10% of the customer delay their decision because of this fires or the fear there are at least many old customers so waiting in effect it's a blessing in disguise that you know they don't <laughs> have to deal with angry customers but yeah. what are the waiting periods um, mr gail vivek and uh, neeraj uh, because of this whole uh, supply chain issue 60 days for us vivek I think it depends on the component level, right? As in, uh, there are a few components uh, for VCU uh, which uh, has close to about 120 days uh, kind of timeline. Um, it depends on the vehicle, I guess. Uh, wherever there is VCU, where are there some components? There are components which takes 120 days if everything goes well. So companies have to order in advance and plan for delays, uh, etc. All of that, right? So, uh, but when it comes to customer uh, waiting, uh, we are sitting on 50,000 orders. Uh, Uh, we are yet to fulfill them, so we've just started deliveries. Um, okay. Uh, I think yeah, yeah, orders are crazy, and we have to just. That means a year. So we'll have to see. As in, do we do it? How soon we do it? Yeah, we have to wait. Neeraj. Um, sure. I I think see in terms of components and the supply chain, there are going to be issues for the next couple of years. It's not going to be something that gets resolved easily. Uh, the way we 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 deal with this is we try to sort of identify alternate uh, parts and components um, and build you know supply chain the supply chain to be pretty robust. Um, in terms of the demand itself, I think um, this far is going to far out surpass the supply of uh, components and our vehicles, and uh, we're going to see this again continue for a couple of years. So um, we have over sixty thousand pre-order registrations uh, waiting and. Uh, we are gearing up to start the deliveries of the vehicles very soon right um chetan i also wanted to understand is there any truth to the notion that you know a lot of directly imported battery packs are inherently designed to withstand temperatures up to 130 degrees celsius so ambient temperatures of indian summers should be affecting them and you know that they are not a primary cause uh, well it's a much more nuanced uh Uh, answer for this area, but um, typically a lot of cells you would at a cell level you would do what's called a hot box test, which is up to 130 degrees, um, and so at the cell level you may still find uh, success uh, at the on the site. But then you, you, if you continue to expose it to high temperatures and at high state of charge, then that's when you have a lot of chemical reactions and deterioration on this front. Um, so uh, it's not a one-time exposure, but it's a longer-term continuous exposure. it should not cause a problem but it would cause degradation and degradation over time uh, could cause a problem of an internal short circuit uh, it's also about how you charge it you know the thermal management and the battery management that goes with it so it's not just to say that at a cell level if something can take that temperature the pack level can also look at it on this front so it's it's a holistic view of thinking about it but starting with cells that can take higher temperatures uh, probably put you puts you in an area of a, a better starting point as you think of battery packs right um and you know mr gill and vivek if you can come in on this on the way the battery pack itself is designed you know there is always this notion that it has to be a trade off between safety and performance because um when cells are spaced well it kind of brings down the performance that's the notion so it's a constant trade off that oems have to make um how do you deal with this and perhaps neeraj can also chime in Well, it's not like other panelists are saying. Any chemistry can be handled, provided you have a complementary and comprehensive safety mechanism built to handle that chemistry. So that way, it's not that this chemistry is cheaper, better, or safer. But you have to deal it accordingly. Similarly, any design, whether it is a plastic, metal, aluminium, etc., or other things. they have to be designed in consonance with the motor power controller and so many other part in thinking that you are doing so it's a very sort of a complicated and a complex engineering exercise that you are doing when you are choosing the right battery or doing a designing of a pms etc so from that point of view uh, absolutely you can handle any chemistry but if you want to err on the safer side then you better choose a sort of a less volatile chemistry for the time being and so that you are double safe on that count and you don't need to kick in so many of the safety layering on top of it and yet be slightly more confident that the battery is won't at least explode they will only smolder for example vivek is the all 
is the issue also that many of these battery packs are you know being imported directly and you know you just slap on your label and then it's used it's not being assembled here is is that again an issue with some of the players at least not all but some of them are just directly importing battery packs and using it in vehicles instead of assembling it here so um, uh, to be fair on this uh, nochandra i think there are definitely uh, uh, oems who are assembling everything in india just getting everything from china right so there at least battery plays a very important role uh, uh, where uh, at least you should have like so in the sir, sir mentioned there has to be a lot of checks at the supplier level as well right you should not just go out buy some battery and some bms and try to put it on your vehicle uh, you should know end to end uh, what are the cells which have gone into it um uh, uh, is it a premium cell is it a tier 2 cell tier 3 cell um, uh, and uh, uh, also does it need thermal management based on the way you are utilizing the power on this vehicle uh, also what we have seen is uh, a lot of times uh, not just the battery cells battery and uh, battery not having proper bms also the charges are dumb charges right as in the charger will continue to send energy all the time uh, while the chargers if they are smart and if they can talk to bms it can cut off power right so it's all about uh see by chemistry the things which will happen in the battery or cells right but you can always manage an incident by cutting off the power right when it says when i say cut off the power either in terms of charging it or discharging it right that itself will solve for a lot of things so the bms the charger have to talk to each other when it talks when you talk about sending the energy there and let's say if you're sending the energy too much let's say fast charging you should have the appropriate thermal management for the kind of temperature which is building in there so it's it's all equation right in a way so if you're fast charging there has to be a better thermal management based on what what kind of energy are you sending inside the battery second if you're taking too much energy from the battery to a ch- to a motor right let's say you're using a 2 kilowatt hour uh, battery to power let's say 6 kilowatt or 4 kilowatt motor which means that you're already kind of taking all possible juice in a very short time to power the motor right so now again you have to make sure that uh, thermal management everything around that has to be smart uh um, so there has to be a equilibrium between the battery capacity and the motor capacity and how you draw power or how you send power so uh i think if if you compromise any of these things at least your design and everything has to be checks and balances have to be smart on making sure that there are no incidents um like everyone is telling here there are too many things in the equation and uh, only the oem will know what what uh, lever they are going to leverage and what they are going to tweak right so they have to be smart when they are doing this probably neeraj can add more to this sure i think uh, all of the problems that you spoke about we've been you know the way i i see it is that uh, in terms of we've been working on you know um, the, the the technology uh, within the battery packs and you know our entire drive train for the last 5 years and i would say as much engineering effort has gone into the battery itself as the rest of the vehicle right if you have to talk about in terms of the amount of resources time and effort spent um and there is a need for responsible engineering right now when we talk about evs and battery safety um and if you just take the analogy of ic engines right it's not that um you have a petrol tank which is filled with you know a flammable fluid like you have gasoline diesel or you know petrol and you know that has a very low ignition temperature and it's right above an engine where the surface temperature is you know north of 200 degrees but what has happened is that over several decades the engineering that has gone and has made it very safe to a point where you know you are able to deal with combustible fluids and you are able to manage that uh, to a level where you know uh, as long as it doesn't pour out of the fuel tank you're not lighting the vehicle on fire now if you look at the sort of and this applies to any energy dense sort of um, uh, energy dense material right so and lithium ion batteries are no different in that sense there's a very volatile uh, electrolyte within there and uh, you want that to sort of remain stable within the confined confined uh, you know structure of a cell and you still want you know the other part which uh, mr maini was talking about which is uh, there are the cells can withstand up to 130 degrees and actually it's the separator between the electrodes that can withstand that kind of temperature but it also requires uh, you know maintaining and uh, preventing abuse over time let's say there's growth on the electrodes and you know that pierces the sort of separator material then you don't need a 130 degree kind of uh, temperature to uh, result in a thermal runaway so there are so many ways of you know creating problems and also of dealing with these problems it's best to address them at the point where they could arise so whether and that is usually uh, in storage 
during charging or during discharging right so from those right. perspective we manage the operating temperatures and the operating conditions i think uh, it's it's quite you know straight power to build something that uh, can uh, you know work in indian conditions right mr gulati what do you think sorry uh, did someone want to add yeah, something just in, yeah i think i think yeah yeah addition, Chetan, yeah in addition to all the points that we mentioned uh, it's also uh, what will become important for us as an industry is also to look at that system solution for example um, when we look at the battery swapping solution that we use when the batteries come in we actually cool the batteries down so even if it's 45 mm -hmm. degrees outside you know if it's 45 degrees outside and you're trying to charge your battery it's going to get really hot and then you drive it again it's going to get even hotter right but if you don't therefore the swapping solution allows you in such uh, because you can't put air conditioning systems in in scooters at that cost price you can they're very expensive right so you therefore the swapping allows you with certain solution at all to actually cool the battery down right the second thing is that uh, we talked a lot about the charging management right when you separate the charging Uh, across into the station then you can manage the charging much better but also what happens is that in case there is a problem you can actually um say that oh i'm not going to dispense this battery and so you can check on it right um the third part is that you you need to continuously monitor things because there may be things perfect at production but maybe 2 years down the line there's a problem so in in the batteries we use for example we transmit it on 140 data parameters every second and that's analyzed at the cloud and tested and checked and therefore before batteries dispensed or checked out everything is ensured it's working so you could have something perfect now and maybe 3 4 years down the line there could be a deterioration on this area but it doesn't happen overnight it happens over a period of time so early detection mechanisms uh, can really help um, you know alleviate certain risks that we're seeing which are happening right here right so really it comes down to how do you think of a system solution on this area um, and and Uh, the core, of course, has to be really good design, really good battery quality systems, really good uh, thermal management systems, uh, and and critical for that area. But beyond that, I think systems would have a very large role to play in markets like India, especially the scale at which we're doing business, and Got some it. of the products that we have that are highly abused in the country. And for that, you really need continuous checks and balances on. Right, Mr. Gulati, what do you think OEMs need to do to, you know, ensure safety standards are better, to reassure customers? Where do you think the gaps are at this point? You know, uh, from your perspective. See, practically, what I feel today is uh, India has got into EV bandwagon without any preparation. Uh, I'm not saying preparation at the OEM level or where level, but overall, we just jumped into the bandwagon. Whereas, if I talk about the ICE engine, it took us a lot of time and slow and steady. But uh, this EV uh, hype has got up a lot of startups, a lot of new players uh, to come in into the manufacturing of electric vehicles. And I don't know. Ironically, uh, all the major legacy players are uh, still taking time to join this. To so talk about in two wheeler, zero Bajaj, uh, TVS, everybody. has something on the line of for an electric vehicle but they're still not aggressive they are still have launched maybe in two three cities or just showing off their product so all of this has created a gap in between what i feel uh, as of today if you uh, if a customer buys an ice two wheeler he knows how that vehicle works even uh, i remember even uh, a bajaj two wheeler customer used to open and clear this spark plug and use it so those things have gone through in what 3 4 decades and the customers the system the oem the dealers have all adopted it in the by the heart whereas if i talk about the electric vehicle uh, uh, anybody who buys an electric vehicle just treats it as just another two wheeler whereas it's it's a totally different thing that's not an auto thing that's a more like an auto tech product and to understand how an auto works and how an auto tech works i feel somewhere the education is missing with the speed of joining the ev bandwagon we and even the customers everybody was to uh, you can say the, to have an early adoption didn't give the right uh, uh, education to understand so how the vehicle should be charged or even if they are taking out the battery and charging at the home what are the precautions they should take 
or wherever they are charging, is there any other fire uh, igniting things there or some risk? Or what are the kind of uh, electricity they are getting uh, from the grid which can actually charge that quality of battery? So there are a lot of things I feel uh, as an information is missing. Education is missing to the dealer level. But what I feel uh, as of today, a lot of OEMs have come up with uh, FAQs on their uh, websites if you go and search. But those are not actually disseminated to the customer, which is creating more problem. And uh, maybe it's not such a big issue. There are very uh, limited numbers of fire ha happening. Maybe if, if the customer was educated, no doubt there is, there is a fault. I'm not denying that. Maybe if the customer was educated well, he could have avoided these cases or uh, like there is a latest case of uh, a battery bursting and one death happening. So that battery was being charged for one and a half years. So if that thing was working for one and a half years, it means something happened in between that time which uh, resulted to this loss. So I'm not saying that it's a blame to customer or an OEM, but somewhere in between the kind of service needed for an ICE vehicle, the regular, the concept being given to the customer that every two months or every so many kilometers, he has to go to the dealership to get the vehicle service. But does that concept, is there relevant in electric vehicle customers? No, because they don't, they don't majorly the dealership have, doesn't have that kind of service setup. They just come in for tuning or make small changes. So I feel somewhere the OEMs, are to be blamed because they haven't given the right education to the customer that this is not a two-wheeler. This is another mobile type gadget or electric gadget which needs uh, uh, proper care. Okay, before I go to the audience questions, would any of the OEMs like to respond to that? That perhaps we jumped on the EV bandwagon too early, we did not educate customers enough? I think uh, uh, there I would, I would like to step in, right? So I think... Um, um, uh, OEMs today have balance sheet responsibilities. Um, uh, I'm saying it in a live uh, forum uh, comes at a, a great cost. I think OEMs are sitting on a lot of cash. They should invest in R&D. Uh, there's a vacuum. The vacuum today, if the startups don't step in and do this, we will have more and more Chinese imports which are coming in. Uh, as in, I'm not talking about China being bad, but just the bad Chinese scooters getting dumped in rural markets and people just buying it without understanding. To give you an example, right? there are scooters which are coming at 30,000 bucks uh, with a battery and a charger, uh, and nobody's staying, taking responsibilities, right? As in, there's a multi-brand dealership which is open for a few days, um, and people are just buying the scooter because they think the running cost of the scooter is low, right? So I think uh, there is there is a big, and uh, definitely there is awareness and education to, which has to happen, which will happen, which will continue to happen. But I think um, uh, uh, OEMs taking it slow doesn't mean that they're doing, guns, doing something right. Probably it also shows that... Uh, 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 that uh, elephants will take time to move, uh, and they should they should actually start moving on this, right? They're sitting on cash. They're, we all know that this is very important for the country and the, uh, everything, right? So I think uh, OEMs taking it slow doesn't mean that startups who are launching are cutting corners or anything, right? We know ultra wallet folks, I right. know Chetan. So I don't think none of these folks have jumped the brand wagon. I think they've been doing it for almost a decade. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There might be a okay. few companies which are in the wagon. Yeah, I, I'm just going to take a few viewer questions at this point um, because we are getting many. Uh, so this is from Banu Teja. He says, what do you think is the reason for vehicles catching fire? Is it the weather that's solely responsible? What is the role of manufacturing methods and testing techniques? I think we've discussed some of this, but would you like to kind of give a specific answer? Uh, is, is the weather really responsible? The Vivek, I think you have views on this, that it's not the Indian so. summer. Yeah, I think just reiterating on temperatures of cells can handle it, right? So I don't think it's, it's blaming the weather is the easiest way to escape all the responsibility, right? I don't think it's 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 weather alone, right? It's it's like there are many things, and each player you can't generalize and say that this is the reason why all the fires are happening. In each cases, there might be something, right? Like like we saw one case where the battery was being used for one and a half year, which means that there's something which has gone wrong inside the ba battery over a period of time, right? So if there are right ways to understand what's happening inside the battery and precautions are taken, then this would not have happened. So I think each case has to be analyzed. And I don't think we should jump into the conclusion saying that it's just chemistry or this chemistry is just not so for India or Indian weather condition is bad, right? So I think there is no generic answer. 
it, it could be anything and every case it might be something else going wrong right something or other going wrong but i don't think right. indian will be easily managed as such right this question is from mr cu venu gopal he says has any fact finding report come out on reasons for mishaps is it overcharging or wiring issues also what will the performance be during monsoon or water logged roads um any, anyone wants to take this mr yes. gail mr maimi sure sure so i think that uh, like we rightly pointed out each a root cause has to be done right on each area it could be it could be a cell problem it could be a defect it could be a bad weld between connection of cells it could be uh, the battery management system algorithm was wrong it could be the protection circuit didn't work so in each of the cases probably a root cause analysis has to be done to come up on this area but all of them could be it and those the different situations we may have seen may have been seven different um, the independent things that may have caused them on this front here right, right. so there's no one uh, it's cause. one thing you know we all have yeah. to look at the cause in this area right and it's only has to go through a proper a proper process on this front uh, mr gill would you yeah in terms of the in terms of the monsoons on this front um you know the it depends again on the battery type to be honest with you uh, a lot of the batteries today are ip67 which means you can put it under water for 30 minutes under 3 feet Uh, and so if the batteries are classified as that you should be good under monsoons uh, most of the vehicles today are under 48 volts on this area which is 60 volt and under 60 volts even if things are wet and everything you cannot get a shock you you say that's a safety level but when you cross the 60 volt limit um, then you've got to have additional safety protection mechanisms in place so um, when things are wet Uh, but a lot of the a lot of the scooters today and all the new OEMs are all moving to a 48 volt system, which is the right long term global approach. Uh, but there are legacy products that are higher voltages um, that they have higher care uh, in months because when they are wet, uh, more precautions need to be taken. Uh, but again, like any product, you know, you go through rains, it works well. Um, designed well, there shouldn't be a problem at all. Right, Mr. Gill, would you like to add anything? yeah without naming the manufacturers the information we have got in smeb is that in few cases the analysis was done by drdo as well as the since oems and some of the observations are that in one of the case the at a cell level in spite of the fuse blowing the cell became volatile and it it could not arrest the propagation of fire so this it was a defect inside the cell which came out after some period of usage in the other side again the bms was not at all of the right design it was not able to prevent any cutoffs and it was not doing its function of a bms it was simple pcb type of a circuit and in the third i don't know i'm convinced or not convinced but it was more to due to the charging point or the charging mm -hmm. circuit yeah the they uh, is saying that should take care plugged of, it in the uh, wrong uh, socket yeah Yeah, Jada should say take care of such things. So these are the few things we have got from the members. Right, right. Apart from audience questions, we also have a resident EV expert, Parth Charan, joining us. Parth, do you have any questions? I'm sure you've spoken to many people on this panel separately, but any questions that you have? Um, I do. Uh, I would like to apologize for the venue that I'm sitting inside a car, but it's an EV, so I think. It's, <laughs> um, my my first question was. Uh, to anyone who answered it, is that you know, is there some truth to the notion that EV manufacturers who manufacture their own battery pack, uh, essentially that it's in, it's vital for an EV manufacturer to be making their own battery packs, and that kind of gives them uh, greater control over testing, etc. So now, from a consumer point of view, uh, should should brands make it apparent to the consumers that what their battery manufacturing process battery pack manufacturing process is like and does that conflict with any sort of you know r&d confidentiality laws so uh, i would i would like to take that so i think uh, uh, explaining a consumer on battery manufacturing process is going to be very complicated right as i think uh, what would you tell him and how would you communicate this right so it becomes very complicated i think um, uh, we'll have to see what what way can we communicate what what are the tests which are done on the site so um and also the problem is like like we have all been talking about this it's just not testing at the beginning of the battery it's a continuous process right so 
so to give a simple example how do you say that your bms works right bms is a bunch of codes which will which works with hardware and does smart things right so how do you communicate this it's it's invisible right so how do you talk about this so unless there is a independent authority which continuously monitors this and certifies bms there is no other way right because there is no way to say this bms is good um uh, assets right it's it's code plus a uh, circuit which which is there right uh when it comes to um, uh, manufacturing whether you are manufacturing or anyone else is manufacturing right so apple gets all of its it's designed by apple and manufactured in china right but th that that doesn't mean that apple phones are bad it's all about what are the controls you have in place what is the kind of visibility that you have in the in the manufacturing process which is important and uh, i think it's it's it starts with uh, ownership self certification uh, making sure that we are doing everything possible to make sure that the batteries are safe and continue to do things which will keep the battery safe right so got it uh, just moving it now doesn't mean part to your point it's, it's i think there's out. a Yeah, Parth. I think to your point, it's it's uh, you know, I mean, in our case, we manufacture our own batteries, right? We, we as part of battery as service, have it over ten OEMs, and it's a, it is a big difference because what happens is you're designing it from the cell level, you're designing every process, you're designing every hardware, every software, you're looking at hundreds of test cases, and then you're testing it with each OEM. You're then manufacturing it with the incoming qualities being checked by you. you know every time we get in we even check life cycle testing which takes us 6 months on this area and uh, and then at end of line you have over 100 tests to do before you ship it out right uh, and then you then managing it over the cloud after that so the criticality is yes as you look at uh, for such an important thing having control over the e either the entire ecosystem is very critical on this area and either you're doing it yourself or you're doing it with partners who have it to to um to Vivek's point of view um on this area but that that visibility into end to end is absolutely critical uh to look at it um uh, if you're just buying something from somewhere else and they change something on your last minute how do you manage it you know so it's important that there's a high level of onus on both battery manufacturers and OEMs um to make sure that they understand the end to end process very well but the and question think, is prior to this uh, i think what is happening right now is uh, in terms of the ev industry there's sort of teething issues um it's sort of an unpopular opinion to so, sort of say that you know all of these companies are going to filter themselves out um <laughs> companies have a good supply chain um you know which have internal controls which have quality controls which have life cycle management are the ones that will survive and last but it's unfortunate that you know um the end outcome is that there are going to be vehicles which uh are of a much lower quality and which consumers are affected where lives and properties are at stake um but what we see is that this has happened before in other industries right we've seen this even when it came to uh, mobile phones there was one i remember the samsung galaxy note uh, series right where there was an issue and then consumers became very very aware of uh, the kinds of risks that were involved and uh, a company like samsung had to sort of take a back step and uh, figure out ways to overcome um this these kinds of safety issues but what you see today is we don't have cell cellular and mobile phones exploding if we keep them on the dashboards of our cars in you know sunlight right uh, there's certain levels of controls built in and i think the ev industry's uh, uh moment is here in terms of being able to filter out you know quality products and uh, it's it it was only a matter of time before something like this happened but essentially are you saying that the customer at this point you know given what vivek said uh, given that it's such a complicated subject and to be able to educate them to tell apart the good quality bms from the from something that's not very good uh, is a very big challenge uh, is it just the precedent set by a brand that they now have to essentially depend on uh, and will these incidents sort of you know filter out like all these brands which are uh, not performing so that we can maybe in a couple of years have a very safe uh, ecosystem yeah right, will so it in fact separate the wheat from the chaff so to speak yeah i i think there's two points to it one is that we got to realize we've had six or eight instances with probably half a million plus vehicles out there and i'm sure there's an equal number of petrol vehicles that have gotten fire but haven't hit the front pages of our newspapers 
it doesn't mean this is not very important, right? But I'm just saying from a perspective, these are happening as part of any industry, right? Um, I do believe there's an opportunity for the industry to wake up. And I do believe there's an opportunity for certain certification agencies. And, you know, the new policy that has been talked about, it's possible that BE and others may come in to say there's a star rating and other areas would come in, which would enable consumers to say, hey, I understand there's a difference between battery type A and B. If the management system is at a higher level, it's a higher rating. And so like today, people have air conditioners and there's a rating system. You don't know if this air conditioner is efficient or not. You just buy it. But the rating helps you to make an informed decision. I do believe over time and um, such things coming in would help an end consumer to understand and differentiate between A and B on this area. You have it for crash ratings today in cars. At one point, we never knew what's a five-star rating for a car. You just buy it, right? And yes. now there is processes. So those are above and beyond um, the regulatory framework, right? The star ratings are something that third parties would do and other agencies would do. And I do believe there's an opportunity some, for things like this to come to create better com consumer awareness and confidence. Um, Mr. Gill and um, uh, Mr. Gulati, I think both of you can be in. Mr. Gill, if you can be in. What did you make of, you know, the tonality of what Nitin Gadkari said yesterday? I mean, um, was it, you know, uh, a very stern message in your opinion? He said that they are going to come out with guidelines. They will levy a hefty penalty. But he's also said that automakers should voluntarily recall you know, vehicles and not wait for the government to come down hard on them. What did you make of it? I mean, was it, in a sense, inevitable after all this happened? Well, Mr. Gadkari has been taking initiatives one after another. The first was sending investigative teams to find out the reasons and causes. Then he sort of nudged the manufacturers. I remember one of the uh, manufacturers had to go, was summoned by MOHRT and told to sort of nudged into calling of recall. So they gave a press statement that we'll recall 2000 vehicles. And the third part is a penalty, stricter penalty. So penalty is a financial outcome, which is a part of a business loss or gain. So I don't know whether what sort of penalty would really help or not, but deterrence would certainly. So I believe message is good, but we have to work more than the message, take the essence of it, that something serious has happened. Everybody has to pull in. Certification agencies have been already told to urgently come out with new standards and OEMs have been told to better be serious about it. So that's good enough for the time being. So I feel, uh, yeah, I, uh, frankly, whatever uh, has the message has been given by Mr. Gadkari is nothing new. It's the similar thing what is already there for ice manufacturers also. There is a there already around a year back a recall a government order came in where the, they have to recall and there is a penalty in even up there in consumer forum also it has been established. So it's nothing new. It's it's for the auto OEMs. They have to ab abide by that. But yes, the way he has expressed it and the word using of penalty, yes, it clearly shows that he's used it tough uh, on it. And uh, I feel that was the required required thing seeing the how mushroom growth is happening today on electric vehicle manufacturer mainly in two-wheeler and three-wheeler segment that was the needed thing but it's nothing new it's just the uh, expression or reiteration of what the policies are for vehicle manufacturers um, but as manufacturers i would like to ask you all at what point should a brand initiate a recall and you know what how much can it set them back, especially a new brand? And why are we seeing only some of them go ahead with it and the others are not doing that? It's a difficult question, but it depends on what is the impact. First of all, if it is a life and property, obviously that is the ultimate thing. So that means you have to really go deeper into roots and go to the last point and see it doesn't repeat again. So depending on the intensity of incident and the type of corrections you can do at source, at the customer end or at the factory end, you have to decide. So there's no percentage like type of a level that beyond 5% you should recall or something. It's more to do with the brand that you are carrying, the respect of the brand and the seriousness of business that you want to do. So it's an individual choice to a certain extent, but when it is threatening life and property, then it becomes a public issue. That's the time when the category is getting sort of a beating. There every OEM who has such incident 
has to act very swiftly to see to it it doesn't repeat again but it is in in a sense in this case it's a life and death issue consistently across the sector all the issues that we are seeing um, are life threatening um, so should a brand yeah, two of the two of the manufacturers have recalled their vehicles who had repeated incidents like the others who had the one stray incident haven't yet gone for a recall so i think it's consistent with the intensity of uh, incidents happening right um you know from a consumer standpoint i mean this could be people sitting on the fence people you know who are wondering if they should buy a vehicle um is there some essential knowledge that will perhaps help them make better decisions um should they look into pack design should they look at how open the brand has been about you know what they've built or how they've built i mean if you have to give like give us say two tips and tricks that we can share with our viewers what would they be uh, perhaps uh, instead of giving the way yeah, can certainly there is a possibility at this point of time that consumer who is believing and just buying has to be a little more learned either by himself or by oems to make the right choice and there are ways and means of knowing at least at some level if we, even if it's not technical by calling the company at the call centers or going into the website or taking a look at the leaflet for technical specs and taking help from some technical friends of what really i'm buying let us go and ask the dealer or the company is it having those safety measures or not and companies will be truthfully telling about it so there are ways and means of buying the right product not entirely but to a certain extent not by blind belief of only brands in fact on the smeb website just day before yesterday i have put in some of the 10 pointers a customer prospective customer should ask uh, in various uh, ways to know that okay this is the way at least i can be slightly more comfortable and uh, pretty okay with buying a battery which i feel would be safe and also i will handle the way i'll handle it so surely from the point where the customer is today he also needs to up his wisdom learned this or some sort of information base through various channels when he is buying a fuel for 7 years along with a vehicle so chandra what we are right. doing is uh, chetan vivek niraj quick so tips and tricks is, for our viewers yeah, yeah. and uh, mr gulat can also add chandra so what we are trying to do is battery instead of it being a black box uh, like uh, our, our batteries have telematics which means that all the parameters can be uh, remotely accessed so what we are doing is we are building a very simple dashboard for uh, 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 the users to see uh, everything which is happening inside a battery in in a in a way that they can understand right so we are trying to make the battery which is a black box uh, to something which they can see what's happening in the battery and when should they be worried about etc all of that so that that gives them comfort so this is one thing that we are doing um, i think that should that should help in a lot of transparency around the battery the users are buying i think uh, i'd like to add to this i think what has really worked for us and what we're seeing where the you know the consumer interest is sort of coming from is when we talk about our testing process when we talk about you know uh, the level and uh, the extreme levels to which we're subjecting our vehicles we recently had a, a sort of campaign which we called uh, beyond asphalt where we pushed our vehicles to you know uh, extreme conditions in terms of terrain in terms of shock in terms of um you know ambient conditions high temperatures uh, misuse and you know uh, we openly and transparently talked about what we've been doing and that started to resonate with uh, consumers and you know we started to see a lot of questions around you know um i i didn't think that an ev could do these kinds of things and it's sort of uh, quite uh, exciting for consumers because they're starting to realize you know that uh, they they expect brands to be talking about these things and um, their minimum expectation in terms of evs is also going to go up um, and um, there are going to be questions around testing and this is something that we are gearing up for so i, I think the um, uh, you know in addition to the in addition to what we've looked at where we've done over 20 million kilometers over three summers and got the experience um, the two big challenges are around temperature and charging and if you actually take these two out of the equation by actually doing it through an swapping station and not all swapping stations are same some do not have thermal management and others but ones that do uh, that really removes the two highest risks out of the system and that gives consumers a lot of confidence um that they don't have to look at it on this area uh, and i think that's another important part as consumers make decisions 
So basically, if uh, you want uh, from our side, uh, the first advice to customers are if they are buying a product EV of a non-national uh, brand, and that too buying a vehicle which it doesn't need to be registered means below 25 kVA. They really need to be very very cautious because all the issues today are coming in that segment. So it's not just fire. The problem is those vehicles are not required to be registered. Means you don't need a DL, you don't, don't need to drive with a helmet, you don't need to see any part of safety. It's not fire. Your own life is on risk because you don't drive it uh, in, in, in a genuine way. So overall, that, that's a biggest threat. Second, I feel that uh, with all that what is happening today, the dealers are also becoming more intelligent. The customers are also becoming more intelligent. And OEMs are also both coming with the details about how to run an EV or what's the precautions to be taken in that. Uh, going further, customers will also take care about that. They will not just treat it like they treat a normal mobile, which has actually come way above uh, as per uh, safety and all those standards. Uh, so I feel these two things will go ahead. Uh, answering the question of part, I feel uh, when he talked about uh, if the OEM should inform the batteries and all or not, I feel today uh, the market as of now is 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 in a category which is called a pull category. Wait for when the market comes to the push category. We'll all come out and give you all the details which can make your decision buy and come and buy our products. Today there are 10 customers for one product. He has no choice if he wants to buy Pure or Okinawa or Ampere or whatever, or even Mounds, because there is 50,000 booking at Mounds. There are 60,000 booking with them. So how can he choose which vehicle to buy? Because if he gets any, he is happy. At least I am in that bandwagon, I bought it. The day these 50,000 will be in the stocks of the dealers, then you'll come to know, we'll announce that the battery is inside, the BMS is with us, it has been tried one lakh cycle. We do it in ICE today. Whenever we launch a product, we clearly say that this vehicle from Kanyakumari to Jammu Kashmir did four times. We do the test drives where all women drive 20 vehicles up and down. Why, why aren't we doing it at EV today? Because that's a different kind of uh, supply chain issue. So, park, wait for two years. You will find all the things on FAC, on uh, different ways being disseminated to customer to help him motivate to buy their own product. That was helpful. Part any closing uh, comments as we kind of come to the end of this discussion? Yes. Well, I had actually two questions. Uh, one is, do you all think that the current AIS testing, uh, you know, certification uh, standard is robust enough? Uh, or is it a work in progress as technology develops? You know, the testing standards will also evolve. So both the AS, you know, the older 038 and the 156 are, are very good standards, you know, including the fact that you have to put it under fire. And uh, in the earlier uh, OS, uh, AS, AIS uh, 038, you also have things like nail penetration. Uh, these are very stringent standards and at global levels. Uh, these, however, certify or qualify one battery pack. I think when you're seeing these one-off issues, um, uh, it's because of something that's gone in a particular in a particular area of manufacturing or quality or something which may not be detectable. So I, I'm not sure if the current standards would detect that. But probably uh, the level of battery management systems, uh, the level of that's been used in these batteries, uh, and a few other parameters could be added to strengthen the quality processes uh, over time. But as a certification process, I think it's, it's a fairly good level. Right. Vivek? I think uh, I think the biggest challenge is that batteries by itself deteriorate over a period of time, right? So, uh, uh, it, uh, the testing, whatever happens in the beginning, doesn't solve for how do you handle the life cycle assets. So, uh, I think what can come off out of all of this is that independent rating agencies, like what Chetan was mentioning, which can actually um, uh, say that they evaluate more than the testing standards and say that okay, this is the data that companies are probably voluntarily sharing and how they manage each of these aspects. And that gives a particular rating, right? So I think that can be a, um, a better approach um, because 
working so it should not also become a bottleneck where you send you expect the government to do this and government takes time or stumbles and it becomes a roadblock right so it's better a private independent reputed agency does this and it can be uh, even if people can companies can voluntarily go up and get this rating done it would be great so uh, i think something of this sort might open up uh, very soon on this right um i have one you know closing uh, question uh, you know before we wrap uh, if there is any advice that you would like to give to customers on how they can kind of keep their vehicle safe you know uh, what would it be any practical advice uh, mr gill or neeraj would you like to uh, say anything well just to be very extra safe it's only most of the time it's very charging that these accidents are happening right and yeah. that's where the vehicle and the person were very near to each other and that led to the loss of property so the the safest if you want to be very safe in case of portable batteries don't charge it inside a closed room charge it on a veranda or somewhere where there's no inflammable components similarly don't charge a scooter inside your house just keep it outside and charge it these are the ultimate safety like if anything happens it won't probably it into a type of a disaster is something yeah. other than that is always keep checking you know while you are handling your product keep checking your charge just put a hand on it and see whether it's over heating on your batteries or otherwise uh, open the seat and see whether there is abnormal heat happening while you are charging the things even that would lead to some sort of an indication because all these incidents have some early uh, warning signs happen so you have to detect a little bit till the time these things get set right these are the abundant precautions which can at least lead to minimizing such incidents or at least eliminating this life and property losses that's very very practical excellent advice sir uh, neeraj would you like to add anything i i really think that you know i'd um, i'd hope that you know consumers are more discerning in their choices um, and you know it really we we don't expect consumers to be checking on the heat of their phones or we don't expect them to you know not charge their phones indoor right so i have a slightly di- different opinion on this okay he has a different view right which is that consumers should not be expected to do something different from what they're already used to doing um it is the responsibility of the manufacturers and the oems uh which means that i'm taking responsibility and we are taking responsibility for the vehicles that we produce and the charging systems that we uh are working with and so the consumer should be you know um flexible and you know open to accepting and you know uh working with companies which are you know willing to provide these quality products right um and they shouldn't have to adjust their lifestyles to go around um um making compromises in their lifestyle to adapt to lower quality products so i i i Vivek, have a which di- what is your view are you on neeraj's side mr gill's side or a mix of both <laughs> Thus, you have to reframe your question. You ask at this point of time with the type of batteries you have, what a consumer can do. So obviously, the wind views will be different. So if you are having a battery which is suspect, then that is a view. So it's it's very tough to answer, right? So, so uh, let, let let consumers be smart when they're buying the scooters. Let them not let them not just go buy a scooter just because it's. Um, Uh, coming at a very throwaway price or something, right? Cheaper, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, like everyone's yes, spoke. China scooters, no registration, nothing. Thirty-five thousand, forty thousand, or whatever, right? So, all of those are like crazy things. So, be careful. Uh, ask a lot of questions. Uh, educate yourself. Uh, uh, and I think the answer is out there. If if you ask uh, those questions, I think uh, people will figure out. So, don't be in a hurry to buy uh, just any random electric scooter and then suffer, right? So. Uh, ideally again we want to make sure that consumers don't have to touch and feel and everything right like but it's the worst thing what what um, we have to ask them to right if, if they've already ended up buying something which doesn't work at least let them keep it outside except all of that but yeah i remember i think mg mg hector or someone had a, a, a announcement uh, i don't think it's in india they said please don't park your car inside electric cars inside um uh, and charge them at uh, least uh, keep it outside or whatever right so that was crazy i was like how can a uh, manufacturer say this but that's the reality today so but uh, yeah it's it's a big challenge uh, hopefully we all work together and solve for it right 
on that note thank you all very much and thank you parth for stepping in uh, for a you know special q and a as well thank you all very much this was an amazing panel we've sort of covered every angle uh, thank you vivek mr gill chetan neeraj mr gulati for you know all your perspective and hopefully this will help more people make informed choices because the ev boom the ev revolution so to speak is here to stay it's not going to go away uh, so the onus is actually on everyone to ensure that we do it in a way that is you know as safe as possible thank you all very much for joining us on money control masterclass thank you for sure thank you, thank you. Thank you.